I'm Ross Rosenberg, the author of The Human Magnet Syndrome and the creator of the Codependency Cure and the Healing the Inner Trauma Child Trauma Resolution Method. I welcome to my YouTube channel. Today, I'm excited because Renee Swanson and I are doing our second collaboration or discussion, and she gracefully and generously agreed to be a guest on my podcast or YouTube channel, and she's going to talk about covert narcissism and how her own story molded her, informed her, led her into better understanding a problem that so few people truly have a mastery over and be able to help others because of that. But what I like to do, if if that's okay with you, Renee, can you let um, our listeners and viewers know a little bit about yourself and what you do? Absolutely. Ross, thank you. And it is a pleasure to be here. Um, I am Renee Swanson. I um, I offer life coaching. I'm a, I'm a coach that specializes now with victims of covert narcissistic abuse. And I've been running a podcast, actually, for quite some time, the Covert Narcissism Podcast. And uh, I actually started on YouTube, but I decided and found out real quick that that wasn't my strength. And uh, when I got into podcasting, that seemed to really connect for me. And so podcasting is is kind of where I landed in that. Tell me a little bit more about um, what you do as a coach. And uh, we were talking right before I hit the record button about you have um, a practice or a group you started. Um, what I do. It? Tell us a little bit more about that. Sure, I do. It started actually as a Facebook group, and it was just a Facebook group so that I could find out, you know, I knew I couldn't be alone out there in this world. Mm -hmm. And so I started a Facebook group with a friend of mine who she didn't have anything to do with covert narcissism, but you got to have a person to start a group with. So I started it with her. And it just exploded on me, um, you know, with people telling their stories and reaching in and, and all of that. And and uh, over time, that group's called Covert Narcissism Group. And over time, I, it actually just kind of shortcut to CNG. And uh, and so I actually now run CNG Life Coaching. And that group is, you know, 58,000 people. But in, uh, wait, in wait, my wait, wait, practice group? now. Wait, wait, wait. I think group. I think your practice. What you have fifty eight thousand people working? With. No, there's no way. Otherwise, this is the Facebook group. Yes. Okay. okay. I'm sorry. You're fifty. Okay. Yes, Please. this is the Facebook group. It's it's reached the level of fifty eight thousand people. So I have a team of moderators that helped me to moderate that. Originally, I was doing all of it, and uh, it just became overwhelming. You know, really fast and and right. too much too much time to try to monitor all of that. But um, but the the then where that be led to was for me to get the training that I needed as a life coach and to start setting up individual coaching sessions and group coaching sessions. And so the the services that I offer, you know, that are that are paid services as opposed to the you know the Facebook group, there's no charge to be in there, the podcast, all of that yeah. is just what I offer to this world. But the individual sessions and the coaching sessions, uh, the individual and group coaching sessions is where we really get into the nitty gritty of that healing journey. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. And people uh, we're going to list her contact information links um, at um, in the details uh, sections of the video or the podcast. Um, I came up with this idea that I wanted to hear your story. But before I say why I thought about that, I, I wanted to tell you a story. Uh, when I first wrote the book, The Human Magnet Syndrome, I wrote a biographical piece. And uh, the, as with the publisher who did not want me to put it in the book. And because I was a new author and I had little say with what I had to do, they um, pretty much um, strongly pushed me into putting it in the epilogue. And I don't know about you, but a lot of people don't read epilogues. And <laughs> I actually do. I'm one of those weird people that do. So. <laughs> well, I do too. Maybe more people read it than not. And and when I it came to writing the second edition, I expanded uh, my biographical piece, and, and I think I called it "Stop Passing the Baton" and used the analogy of a track team where um, each each participant passes. The, the baton off. And of course, you try to win the race. And it became this really complicated ch chapter about four generations of my family. 
And I had this idea that I wanted to entice the reader um, to read further by having them understand that this is a problem that not only affects us, and for me it was codependency, but impacts all the generations um, to come and um, is reflective of all the generations behind us. And that this was not just a personal problem, but a problem that impacts the world, especially a person's world. And I kind of had the idea that the publisher had put in my head that no one wants to hear that, but I didn't listen to that. And it ended up being a resounding success because everyone who read the book told me how important the first chapter was. So I tell you that story because I think people really value the story behind the person. What happened to them that molded them, that created their desire, their ambition, their uh, their focus on becoming the healer, the coach, the psychotherapist. And I would love for you to share your story um, with the listeners or the viewers about your own experience um, in surviving covert narcissism and how that shaped you to become the magnificent, wonderfully qualified and talented woman that you are. Well, Ross, thank you for, and thank you for saying that. And I, and thank you for sharing that story because I think it is crucial to realize, um, you know, what brings us to who we are today and how then, you know, even especially then in raising our own kids, how that filters into their life and their kids and their kids, because this is a generational, I've called it a generational curse uh, of just a repeated pattern. It's a repeated right. pattern throughout so many families. Yeah, I, and I, so I'm, I'm happy to share my story. So, so when did it all start for you? So it started for me back at birth. There is no doubt about that at all. Um, I was raised in the church, um, mm -hmm. in a in a southern church. My dad actually is is a preacher, and uh, very much so was raised in the in the, you know, the church environment. And I was absolutely taught that uh, it was my job to help everyone around me, to keep people happy, to be the peacemaker, to put my needs aside, to care for them, to put my feelings aside, to care for them. And I took it to heart. Um, I grew up a, in essence, a missionary, like it was my mission to help other people. And when I look at, you know, my, my parents' marriage, which by the way, they just celebrated 60 years, um, mm -hmm. it just this last week and, and, and they have a beautiful relationship and a beautiful marriage. But, but when I look at my childhood in that environment, I never saw them argue. I never saw them disagree. I never, it, it was a perfect marriage. And, um, I, so I grew up just thinking, how does a do perfect what? marriage create a child? who will eventually fall in love with a narcissist. And, and I say this just to just ask you, was there parts of your childhood? Because you said you, um, you like naturally were this giver, this helper. And, and, and from my point of view, and it doesn't have to be yours, is that children learn to be givers and helpers and sacrificers because they, they feel like that's how they get the most love and attention. Um, did you, can you trace back your attraction to the covert narcissist to your childhood? Or do you think that that doesn't really apply um, in your case? Oh, it very much so applies. Um, I, for me, I earned that love by then I got the approval of the church. I got mm -hmm. the approval of, you know, um, God's love. What was, what was envisioned to me as God's love. And, and so I very much so um, became that people pleaser because that was my role in life. Not because, I mean, it's natural for me to be compassionate. I have, that is always definitely there. You know, I have my, my father's compassion, but the role, when people ask me, who was your narcissistic parent for me, it was the church. Right. And, and the, the, the church became, you know, that, that overseer that was always judging, always um, superior, always entitled, always demanding my attention and my time. And, um, and so that was the tiptoeing I was doing was right. around the church. It's interesting. You, you said, you know, I can't help being a, a psychotherapist and it drives my friends crazy, but you said, a, you said a word, um, 
um, your role was envisioned. You said, quote, my role, this role was envisioned for me. And, and, and mm -hmm. to me, that's probably, that's a clue to what you're saying is that, that you kind of grew up in an environment where people had um, an idea of what you're supposed to be. And, and that could have very well led you in a direction to, to not have a really clear sense of yourself and your self needs. <laughs> it very much so did. I did not have a clear sense of my own needs because some of the things I was taught was, you know, I'm never allowed to be angry or upset because Christians don't get angry. Um, I'm not allowed to worry or fret because Christians don't worry. That means your faith isn't strong enough. So if I became angry or frustrated over something, the self-judgment was immediate. Of That must mean that I'm not a strong enough Christian and I have to go make things right with God. And so I wasn't allowed to be angry. I couldn't allow myself to be angry. Yeah. And so, so someone distorted the, the gospel um, to fit... Yeah. A belief that you should control parts of that are very human um, mm -hmm. to try to push those down or or discourage them, and and that's really sad that you didn't get a chance to um, be free in the expression of your life and feelings and reactions to it. Right, right. And when I say that you know I never saw my parents fight or argue or disagree, that's very true. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so what it did for me, while that can be good and that can be seen as healthy, what it did for me was it created a belief in me that a husband and wife never fight. They never argue. They never disagree. Okay. Well, now here comes reality and I'm in my marriage. And of course, we're going to disagree because everybody goes through this. Right. But the first time we disagreed, I was horrified that something was wrong with me. And it was my job to fix this because I thought that meant our marriage was at risk. Right. And so I would dive in as fast as I could to fix it, which meant I would just give in like, okay, no, 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 you just do it your way. And I would fawn all over him. But it was immediate. Right. And I didn't think there was anything wrong with it. Right. I thought that was my role. Yeah, it actually reminds me of an article I read years ago. I don't know if it's true or if it was an accurate article, but it said um, because of the Japanese culture's fastidiousness about washing hands and antiseptics and germs, that they found that the kids were growing up with weakened immune systems because they didn't get to, their body didn't get to face the natural challenges out there. So mm -hmm. analogously, um, if your parents got along and did, and everyone was so happy, you didn't get the natural challenges that um, children get in order to learn things, you know. Right. And right. So, and I see even that. in my even in my friendships, I remember as a, in college. So I'm now in, you know around the age of twenty. And if I had a friend that I really disagreed with, I remember just being heartbroken that it meant my friendship was over. It was so extreme, such a, a strong, catastrophic thinking of, you know, well, it just means that this friendship's over. I'm going to lose them as a friend. They're never going to, you know, they're never going to stick around. They're never going to care for me. And it didn't prove to be true. But every single time there was a disagreement, that's where my mind and my heart went. So you had an abandonment response um, yes. that, that if something went wrong, you immediately thought it was your fault and thought if you didn't correct it you would lose that. And, yes. And, and so, then I would so, cling like crazy to fix it. You so, know, then I've got to be the one to fix all that. All. And so that's fed right into a marriage with a covert narcissist, of course. And because this is not a therapy session, thankfully to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and maybe it should be. <laughs> no, no, but but I would suggest, and let's not go in that direction, but I yes. would suggest that um, that lack of experience, that, a fear of abandonment that need to make everything right um, represents your childhood as you as you po mm -hmm. pointed out your experience with the church um, mm -hmm. and so so you're in college and you're um, very sensitive and uh, especially to um, someone not liking you or abandoning you and so how how did that if, if it did, did that type of pattern lead you into being attracted to what someone would be, uh, would end up being a narcissist or, or a covert narcissist? So, so yes, when, um, you know, when I got out of college, I didn't meet my future husband until I was 
I want to say about 24, 25. I'd have to go back and do the, the math again. But it was definitely after college. You know, I'd been out for a couple of years. And um, when I first met him, it it was an immediate hook. Like he liked everything I liked. He wanted everything I wanted. He seemed to be just the perfect match for me. And at this point, I was so eager for a relationship. Like I was just terrified I'm going to live alone forever. I mean, the things you go through in your mid twenties and, and I was eager to, you know, I want to raise a family. And, and so there was some eagerness that maybe the abandonment issue of, okay, nobody's ever going to love me. Nobody's ever. Right. And so there was a combination of all of that going on. And then here I meet this guy who, again, like he, everything I said, I liked, he's like, Oh, wow. I like that too. And yeah. it just seemed to be such an immediate hook that then I was doing everything in my effort to keep him. I was doing everything in my effort to please him to, you know, I'd always said I would date for at least two years, two years before yeah. I'd even consider marrying someone. We yeah. dated for four months. So four basically, months. basically it's the human magnet center, by the way, the human magnet mm -hmm. center, in my opinion, governs all relationships healthy or not but there was this intuitive feeling of of a fit opposite personalities um and it was it felt perfect it delivered you away from insecurity or fear of being alone it probably delivered him away from it too and this great attraction but he's already painting a picture of himself that is not based upon who he really is, but what he believes you want to know in order to get you to fall right. in love with him. Right. Yes, very much so. It was, you know, he was finding the things to say that he believed I wanted in, right. in a relationship. And I know we all do that to some extent. Oh, yeah, of course. But yeah, you you want this other person to be happy with you. And so we all give a little bit in that regard. But it was everything, everything to the T and to the extreme. So we, you all, know, I, I was a classical musician and all of a sudden, you know, that's all, that's all I've ever listened to. And that's all, well, none of that proved to be true. So, so we all put on our best face when we meet someone. And, mm -hmm. um, and it, one of my jokes is um, it might take six months to a year before we um, forget to put the, the toilet seat down or pick up our underwear or put our underwear down on the ground. But everyone normally puts their best face forward and that's normal but sure. sure was it sounded like he was making things up to it to get you to trust him that I mean, essentially were lies right right and it, it's one thing where you know if you say to somebody you know hey i'm a, I'm a classical musician and I've, i'm studying classical music and and the other person says you know hey i've always kind of wanted to learn more about that that's great can you can you teach that's different than oh that's all I that's what I've listened to all my life and I've that's different. So yeah, so he's setting you up like the, the con man, the, the salesman. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Public yes. narcissists, um, as as I pointed out, have some sociopathic qualities. Some are more sociopathic than others, but so he is he is making himself look like the perfect one. So so right. you tell more. So, and, and so what happens is when we're in these, you know, and, and for me, I know I didn't ever actually see him for who he really was. You know, all I'm seeing is actually who I want to see and who I wanted to see was this perfect match, this soulmate or this, you know, my wonderful husband. And, and that's what I saw. And so then things happen like, he might be sharp tongued with somebody else. Like I would see that he gets sharp tongued when we were with some friends or when we were, you know, out in public. And right. I remember thinking, well, but he's not that way with me. Right. And so it was easy to kind of somehow that makes it okay. Right. I don't, and, and that should never be okay. Okay. But, but I somehow allowed that to be okay because I found myself thinking, well, at least he's not, he's not like that with me. Right. If you were thinking, Hey, at least they aren't like that with me. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of time. Right. So, yeah. And so, so he is calculating how much he needs to be with you in order to keep you connected and hooked. And because he really is a narcissist, there's the parts of him, his mask falls off with other people. And yes, you're, you're feeling secure because you think, well, it's for them, not me. And, and you're being very hopeful 
Um, and uh, so what what happened next? I mean, what was the next uh, phase of, of that relationship? So we we got married. We were madly in love. We were the perfect couple. Everybody looked at us like we were just such a great fit for each other. And I want to tell you, the honeymoon phase actually lasted a really long time. Mm-hmm. Um, now, it was because I could never let an argument happen. Like I was ter- Do I? No. How long did it last? I'm going to say that honeymoon phase, if you want to call it a honeymoon phase, it's also rose-colored glasses phase, yeah. uh, lasted probably a good six or seven years. And I just, I made it my goal to always keep him happy. And so if there was ever a disagreement or an argument, I i mean, instant. I was jumping in to fix that and take care of it and cover everything up. We had kids a couple of years into the marriage. We had kids. So I just got very occupied being a mom, uh, being a wife. And everybody looked at us like they thought we were great together. So for six or seven years, he was able to keep his mask on because for whatever reason, um, you were exactly what he needed. Nar- pathological mm-hmm. narcissist. Uh, whether the coverts, which are more secretive and and systematically um, manipulative, but you know, but on a QT, um, you were not a problem. You did everything for him. You enjoyed. You loved. You appreciated your role. And um, what? And so I can I think of a narcissist thinking, why why should anything be bad? she gives me everything and makes me happy right when did right things, when did things shift well it it shifted gradually i i definitely will say that until a couple of very significant milestones happen mm-hmm. but i remember looking back making in my head i was making what i call my never again list mm-hmm. i'll never say it that way again i'll never do that again i'll never talk about this again you know, that's my my never again list. And and it goes on forever. Like, I didn't realize how long my list was getting. Topics weren't safe to talk about. Um, opinions definitely were not safe to be voiced. And, and every time that I would, you know, would try and I would get met back with so much resistance or harshness, yeah. it just instantly went on my never again list. And it just kept growing. So, so And so that went on for so years. Really- so it really wasn't because of your perspective of growing up it really wasn't a honeymoon per se um because um but consciously it probably was because if you did something to upset him you made quick adjust, adjustments and there was no stress or uh, there was no conflict but there were pro- but if someone's looking from the outside there's problems happening right away but you're absorbing them and not letting them feel consciously obvious. So it sounded like there was a lot of problems right away, but you were just so amenable to change and willing to accommodate him. And that must have taken a lot out of you over time. It very much so did. I mean, I was just, I became a contortionist. Okay, I'll turn this way. I'll turn that way. I'll, you know, it's like the the amoeba that just kind of gravitates and moves around. You talk about that dance, you know, and it's, I just, you want to turn this way, we turn this way. You want to move that way, we move this way. Uh, I became really, really good at it. And, and you said tired too. What, Exhausted. What, what, yeah, <laughs> what was the impact yeah. of that, um, of, of being this contortionist? So the impact was um, a couple of things that really started to take place. One is isolation from my friends. Mm-hmm. Because for starters, I didn't have time. I didn't have time to go have friendships because I was so busy keeping him at peace. Uh, Another big reason was because it wasn't worth the price I paid at home. If I went and did things with friends, I got met with judgment and jealousy and, you know, just that, that silent treatment, cold shoulder, circular conversations, all the things. And so it wasn't worth it to me. So I actually sacrificed a lot of my own friendships, a lot of my own, you know, relationships with, with girlfriends that I was, that were an active part of my life. Uh, another effect that it had was I wasn't able to be the mom that I wanted to be. And I knew I could be because right. I was constantly consumed by my concerns over his reactions, his thing, his words, his, you know, how would he react if I do this, if I do that? And so I was modifying my role with my kids to accommodate him. 
and question. it's just not healthy. I have a question. Um, have you ever thought about that he knew what he was doing, that he um, knew and he was doing something overtly or covertly to make you know what was wrong that could potentially upset him and change before he got upset? Because you're talking about you did anything to make him happy, but I'm wondering if there was something in the background, um, gaslighting, brainwashing, that he was giving you hints on what not to do that would make him unhappy. So the million dollar question is, is he aware of it or not? You know, and a lot of people ask me that is, do they know what they're doing or do they not? And, and I will say that, you know, all this time that I, that I was in that marriage with him and, and mm -hmm. going through all of this, do I really truly think that he was trying to hurt us? I really don't. Mm -hmm. I don't think that, um, I don't think he's an evil, malicious person. I I honestly think that he is, was a lot completely not aware of what he was doing. Um, I think it was his own survival tactics from his childhood that were being triggered that caused him to interact with us in the way he was. Right. But when he, when I would have discussions about him with him about the anger that he was portraying to all of us, like he had no clue that anger is what had come out and anger is what had been shown and um and so in that regard do i think that things were happening that were subconscious for him yes 100 percent. do i think there were things that he was doing that was communicating to me there was going to be a problem before the problem ever came 100 percent. So I'm, I'm not sure how much of it he was aware of so i'm going to challenge you so um he was different with people other people than you so he was difficult uh not sensitive, not empathetic. I'm generalizing. So if I'm wrong, let me know. Yeah. But with you, if someone is be is different with one group of people and not another, then they're making adjustments and they're conscious of it. You know, if I'm looking, if I'm on a job interview <laughs> or on a first date, I'm going to be mm -hmm. much different than if I'm talking to my brother who just naturally annoys me. Um, and so, <laughs> so my, my suggestion and and of course, uh, we don't need to figure this out. But my suggestion is that um, he was malicious because he made decisions of who he did what to based upon what you said. And he needed yeah. you to not think he was malicious to keep uh, uh, what keep it escalating to a point. Um, do you so? Was there ever a clue that maybe he knew what he was doing and he had an idea of of why it benefited him? Or you, you think he was pretty much well, the, I think I think there's a weird combination there. Um, I do think because he would treat us differently when other people were around right. than when other people were not around. So he knew what he was doing. He, he was knew what he was doing. Yes, but he, he needed, knew what he was doing. But he needed but, to know um, he was oblivious and didn't know what was going on so he can play the no. victim. Now, by the yes. way, if I say something that doesn't feel right, just say, nah, wrong. <laughs> so, 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 so no, it's the, the problem is it's such a weird combination. Right, I right. think his desire to be a good person was very genuine. I think he desired to be, to be a, a good, good husband. To be a good to person. To he desired right. to be a good person according to what he needed. Right. Not I don't think he can make that connection as to what that really means. Right. So he, he had a desire, narcissistic desire to um, look like a good person. He just had no ability to understand that included taking care of other people. Right. Which is right. And I, he's a narcissist and we know that. So he's right. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so that's where I think the conflict lies, um, where where it's, you know, he knew because he would behave in a certain way when other people were around, he knew, mm -hmm. you know, what it what it really should look like in a home, what what there should be, you know, interactions that are healthy and positive and good. But behind closed doors, he definitely was not capable of maintaining that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah again, you're painting a picture of his sociopathic traits. He mm -hmm. knew what was right in order to survive, you have to create an image, an outside image, 
in order to survive in society. But right. when you're home, the covert narcissist is lets the mass down and they are themselves. Right. And it, and well, it, when when other people were in the home, it was like we were back in that dating time when he was fulfilling that perfect role. Yeah. He, yeah so he, it was a, it was part of the con game. And yeah. uh, and uh, so so please continue. <laughs> <laughs> so the years just went by and I made so many excuses for him right, right. of, you know, well, he's just having a bad day or he's just not feeling well, or he's stressed at work. Like I became the expert at excuses. Okay. Right. And I was making these excuses to our own kids and saying, you know, well, you know, daddy's just having a bad day today, or he's not feeling good, whatever. And, and our kids were hurting, you know, um, they were definitely were hurting. And it was they're the next generation. They're being just like you were, just like I was. We uh, we don't know that, but they're being hurt because they're a, a part of something that doesn't make sense. Right. Well, yes, the cognitive dissonance that's there is right. massive because, right. and even even in myself, when I hear myself say, "Well, I don't think he ever meant to actually hurt us," mm -hmm. and yet all of this is going on. So, I mean it. It's still there's that that trying to make sense out of this is like trying to catch a ghost. It'll make sense one minute and then it just completely disappears in front of you. Let and that's what my kids were experiencing. Let me paraphrase it. I'm trying to make sense of it is like catching a ghost. And he made sure he was a ghost because um, if he is an apparition and, and not easy to to identify, then he gets to survive. So mm -hmm. yeah, he probably. Mm -hmm probably was very conscious of um, making sure that you or um, couldn't see it because that probably made it made him last longer in the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he got really good at when the anger came out, the anger instantly fed into his victim role. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you think he did that and, or was it reactive? I think it was reactive. I think a large chunk, of it with I think the anger was reactive. Now the victim role, that one I think there's definitely a little bit more purpose there. So the uh, but the anger was a reactive. So he there would be a narcissistic injury and then he would calculate um like covert narcissists and sociopaths do, what do I need to do in order to get what I want, which is get someone to stop doing something they don't like or to do something they want. Mm -hmm. And and that must have really it had to take a toll on on you. Yes. Yes, definitely. I mean, I, I physically, it was taking a massive toll. My body was one giant um, wad of muscles. Okay. Mm -hmm. Everything tense, everything tight, headaches constantly. I was dropping weight, um, very unhealthy uh, and, and still trying to, to juggle all of this. It was like, I was trying to swim the Atlantic holding two kids up because they're both drowning in this as well. And I'm trying to make sense out of it. Right. Um, and so as this went forward, you know, I never actually considered you know, because of all the excuses and all sweeping everything under the rug, I never truly considered that he actually was a mean person. Right. And that just never crossed my mind. He, he can't be, it wasn't even that, okay, is he, maybe he is, it was never even a consideration. So my question is, was he that good at pretending to not be mean around you? Or was he really good at gaslighting you to make you believe he is being nice when he's not? And you might not know, so just skip the question. Because or, or was I that good at ignoring it and pushing it under and, and living in my own false sense of reality? I know, but but you, that's true. That's a fact. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Because um, that was my fact. That's a fact of probably all SLDs or codependents listening. But the reason I ask you that is I want people to understand that covert narcissists need us to blame ourselves and to feel like we're missing something when in the background they're orchestrating it so yes, when that did, is very true. when did things fall apart when when did it become intolerable for you so around our it was our, our 10th wedding anniversary was a was a massive blow up and a, and a big ordeal that was very eye-opening for me and, and if you i'm not going to share the whole story here but if you listen to my podcast you know you'll find it there mm -hmm. but it's really the first time that i really thought okay something is wrong here mm -hmm. like it's not me trying to cover everything up anymore it was the first time i think i put my own glasses down right. and went what's going on you and down, and I you started. Probably put, you probably put the, your own glasses down 
but those he put in the lenses. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> put, yes. My, okay, but go ahead. So yep. you put your you put your glasses down and you started to see things differently. I did. I started to kind of watch more. I became more of an observer. Now I was yeah. still pretty hooked. I'm not gonna say it was instant. And like I said, right. this whole process was very gradual. But it started to become a little more frequent that I just kept watching, going, why is he behaving this way? Instead of instantly jumping in to fix it. Right. And I started opening up to a friend of mine. We had been this. So this that, that phase lasted still again for several years. So about mm -hmm. 14 years into our marriage, wow. I actually for the first time opened up to a friend of mine at a coffee shop and just said, I'm really confused in my marriage and I'm really not happy. And she and I just started talking like a lot. Mm -hmm. And we were having coffee about once a month. And, and I just I would be on the phone with her on a regular basis. And the more I talked with her, she kept encouraging me, go see a therapist, go talk to somebody, you mm -hmm. know, go, go explore this. And she kept pushing on that. And I, no, it's okay. I don't need a therapist. Like we're okay. Uh, and I just, again, I dig in and do the work I needed to do or believed I needed to do. And finally, 17 years into the marriage, I set an appointment with a therapist. And I went and talked with them. And I, at this point, the word narcissism was not even on my radar like this. No, I, I went into the therapy session and, and he said to me, okay, tell me why you're here. And I said, well, I'm, I'm here to talk about two things. And he said, okay. And I said, my church and my marriage. Right. And he kind of laughed and went, boy, that's a loaded statement in and of itself. And, and so I started opening up about my marriage within five minutes. He said, do you know what the word narcissism is? And I said, kind of, I said, I, I mean, I know a little mm -hmm. bit about it, but he said, mm -hmm. let me describe it to you. My jaw hit the ground as he described what I was living. So, so and he, he described probably the diagnosis, narcissistic personality disorder. And I say that because there's a lot of stuff out there on the internet where we talk about nurse, mean, nasty narcissist, but there to someone who's a psychotherapist, there's an actual disorder, a personality disorder. That yes. is that is a person that has no ability to understand why they're hurting someone and change and is is sometimes yeah. ruthlessly focused just on themselves. So he yeah. he put the light bulb over your head that went off. <laughs> Yes. Like. Yes. Although I'm going to say even in that first session, one thing he said to me kicked me right back into my, you know, I'm going to fix this mode. Because one of the things he said to me was narcissists don't ever change. And my immediate words to him were, then my husband's not a narcissist, because he can change, help me find the right words so that he can change. So, yeah, okay, I still was trying to fix this. Yeah. So he had you had not yet had your podcast, and I had not yet probably had my YouTube <laughs> videos out there. And the world, no. had, were, they were unaware of covert narcissists. And right. as I say, um, covert narcissists have elements of antisocial personality disorder or sociopathy, and so they they actually mm -hmm. know what they're doing, and so they can they need to seem human for the codependent, um, which would be me in the relationship or you, so that mm -hmm. they can be, so that the victim like you or me, who has empathy, look at them as human. And so mm -hmm. they have to like inculcate that belief. And so it was a shock to your system when you heard this Very guy much so. incorrectly tell you about one, uh, one type of narcissist. Yes. So, so you thought he could change. And so, and what, what did you end up figuring out? So, so he recommended a book and, and the book is titled the wizard of Oz and other. Narcissists. Oh my gosh. My favorite book on narcissism. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. And he recommended it. And I stopped mm -hmm. on the way home and I bought that book. I stopped at a bookstore and I bought the book. Eleanor, so, pa Eleanor Payson. The, and it is the wizard. What's it called? Uh, the wizard, the of wizard Oz. of Oz and other narcissists Buy the book. Oh, yes. Buy the book. It's a fantastic book. Mm -hmm. And and I went home that night and everybody had gone to bed and I sat down on my couch and I started reading. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, I'm going to see what he's talking about here. First chapter. Yeah. I mean, a lot of things line up. Not quite 
you know, right, not, yeah. okay, this, yeah, it kind of, it's there. Then I get into this next section and it's covert narcissism. And check, check, check. I start checking boxes. This lines up. I sat there on the couch and just sobbed. Right. Somebody gets it. I finally felt seen. I finally felt heard. I finally felt validated. Somebody out there gets it enough that they even wrote a book about it. Right. And and what also happened, probably unconsciously, the spell that he created um, of because it did not happen by accident. Um, um, you, like most of us, we think it's our fault. But if you lasted 17 years, he consciously did things or didn't do things to keep you in the dark. And so you started mm -hmm. to see him like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. Behind the curtain, yes. Yeah. And once you see it, you cannot unsee it. Right. And and then it started watching. And then I really became an observer of my marriage because even this was at 17 years of marriage. And I um, I still was there another three years. The mm -hmm. divorce did not happen until um, almost 21 years of marriage. And um, and I just everything was clicking. All of a sudden I'm, I'm looking at it going, OK, that's why I feel this way. That's why I feel this way. That's why. And I started putting the pieces together. So I continued with this therapist actually for quite a while. And my goal at that point was to learn everything I could possibly learn about narcissism, covert narcissism, codependency, mm -hmm. everything. Again. And what can I do to help my kids? Because at that point, I was dug in for all I was worth to help them. Sounds like a great therapist. Um, you got yeah. lucky. A lot of them, yes. don't, unfortunately, don't have a clue about codependency which is why I, I wrote my books and why I'm writing my next book, The Codependency Revolution. But he sounded like he also knew a lot about pathological narcissism and the connection. Yes. So, yes. Well, he had his own experience with it in his past. Right. And I think that's, that's the key. I don't think somebody can under, truly understand this unless they've lived it too. Yeah. So your eyes are getting open. You're learning more. Um, you, without knowing it, he's neutralizing, reversing the gaslighting. You're starting to understand who he is, is not equal to what you see or what he wants you to see. So where mm -hmm. did that lead? Where did that lead you? So it actually, one of the things that happened for me was now when the the gaslighting came or the blaming, a lot of blame shifting, okay, going yeah. on, a lot of guilt manipulating. Um, when these things were happening, I remember in my mind, you know, used to be that would send me into that fight or flight response, um, you know, the pit in my stomach and, and all the adrenaline and all of this. Now, instead, when that happened in my mind, I'm thinking, hey, thank you. Thank you. I needed another one to make sure I understand this. You know, now I can understand a little bit better, a little bit more. And and then when we'd get into that, there's this weird peacefulness that have a weird calmness right. that just happens because this abuse amnesia, which is a real thing. And, and the next morning after he's treated me, you know, abusively, it's like it just disappeared, you know, from his world and, and it used abuse. to disappear from my world. Abuse amnesia. Tell, tell our listeners what that means. Tell me what it so, means. because It right, sounds really like a, a really good term. What's abuse. Amnesia? Yes. Well, so it's it's when, okay, you go to bed uh, that night in, in absolutely in tears because of the circular conversation, the, mm -hmm. the four hour long conversation, you're blamed for everything. Uh, maybe it turns into a full on fight, who knows? And and you go to bed and the next morning it's, oh, hey, babe, you want a cup of coffee? You know, can I make you some breakfast? It's like it never happened. And so it just goes away. So to the abuse amnesia, I will add a codependent has unconscious, some conscious fear of abandonment, pathological loneliness, and they so much identify safety in a relationship that it um, um, sabotages your rational thinking. So yes. that fear is so deep and unconscious that there is a stronger need to forget it. Um, yes. So, so when you, they wake up pretending need, like but, everything's yeah. fine, right? You exactly. jump right on board with that, right? Yeah, so. yeah. And so then you, we were living in this like it's like you're just in this weird like twilight zone is what I used right. to call it of just none of that happened. 
And and I I would be in that weird place. And I remember thinking, well, that's okay. He'll he'll show me again. You know, it's okay to just be okay being peaceful while I'm getting healing, while I'm figuring out how to help my kids, while I'm figuring out what I'm going to do in my life. I was able to allow things to just disappear now because I understood it more. And I always knew it would come back. I mm-hmm. always could count. It's the one thing I could always count on is it will come back. What will come back? The abusiveness. Right. The the right. gaslighting, the blaming, like even though things right now he's being nice. That's what I hear from people a lot when they meet with me is what do I do now when when he or she is being nice? And I'm like, you just you just accept the peacefulness while you go figure out what you want to do in your life and with your world and make sense of this. But you don't have to stay angry at him all the time. It's okay to not. In a sense, you're out of the trance. Um, and my and I suggest the trance was um, as SLDs. You know, we bring that to the relationship, and the the narcissist creates it. So you're out of the trance. You're seeing things. You're not forgetting things. You're collecting information. Mm-hmm. What happens next? So you're collecting, I started journaling and documenting everything, all the Mm -hmm. memories I had, all the current things going on. I just Mm -hmm. started, I mean, like a madman, I was doing all of this. And then I remember reaching the point where I wrote, I actually wrote it and I typed it because this was on the computer, but I typed the prosecution rest. That's so interesting. I didn't need any more. I didn't need any more evidence. I didn't need any more proof. And I started moving towards divorce. You neutralize the gaslighting, you neutralize the generational, generationally implanted SLDD denial or codependency denial. And so you woke up, you saw mm-hmm. or what it was. So you sought a divorce and, and, and from there, what happened? So the divorce part was actually pretty smooth and easy. I will say that um, he, you know, very much so wanted to protect his image and all of this. And, and I let him, I'm like, I don't, I don't have anything to defend to him anymore. I don't have anything to prove to him anymore. And so that part actually was pretty quick and easy and over. Uh, and so I, I, wait, hold on. I don't mean to interrupt, but I want to make an important distinction. It went easy because he's a covert narcissist. He's a sociopath. You are smart, intelligent. You figure things out. He has more to lose. He's not a typical grandiose narcissist where he's oblivious. He knows what's going on. And if he should fight it, there's more to lose. So then he's better off at being that it's um, uh, um, a amicable. amicable. And that mm-hmm. is, that's a sign of covert nar- narcissism uh, who has effectively and accurately evaluated the person to know they're a threat to let them go. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fair. And that's a very, very valid point. And and I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to ponder that some because I I I <laughs> yeah. definitely I like what you're saying there and I definitely would would agree with that. Yeah. And um and so the divorce the divorce happened and I just kind of moved forward with my life. My Facebook group um definitely exploded. Um mm. I started the Facebook group before the divorce. Uh, actually had happened before we'd filed or anything. Um, but it was after that then that I just poured so much more time and energy into it. And so now, you know, my healing path has been just exploded on me. My boys, uh, you know, it really changed my relationship with them within the marriage. Actually, my relationship right. with them changed a lot because when I quit putting so much effort and energy into my marriage and uh, quit like defending him, quit in essence, gaslighting my kids, Mm -hmm. then my relationship with them really became a relationship of honesty and trust and safety. Yeah. You woke up, you were in a trance. He, he was more diabolical than you thought, because of course, all SLDs come to the relationship with their own stuff that makes them the perfect victim for a covert narcissist. But you woke up, you started to see the world as it was. And your children, you know, I, I imagine, you know, l- like flowers or um, needing extra sunlight and extra water. Um, mm-hmm. Beautiful children already just began to flourish because they, they were, you were now, oh, they needed a mom who was awake. So that's, yes. that's, that sounds really cool. Yes. While they, yes, they absolutely began to flourish, but they also had their own 
Um, at that point, they had to go through the process as well of putting their own glasses down. That's hard. And so there definitely was some painful, um, some painful periods of that growth as well. Especially if he's in, if he's also in their heads. But right. But they had a role model, model mother who was going to show them what's real and what's true. So you started. Right. So you, your Facebook page um, started to explode. When did this harrowing experience, this triumph of of human spirit, of your courage, of your survival, um, motivation to survive, when or how did that translate into you becoming a coach? So when I when I say I dug into the research on covert narcissism, yeah. you know, I, I have a master's in actually in music. And, mm -hmm. and I researched a lot in that. There's a lot of effort that went into that. It doesn't touch the amount of research I put into narcissism. I mean, yeah. I dove in full yeah. on. Um, it's yeah. it's like doing the work of a PhD is how how it you know I got my my marriage certificate, but instead I, I came out with a you know a PhD in narcissism. <laughs> and funny. and so I was doing all of this educating myself and reading and I was doing it for myself and for my kids mm -hmm. in the Facebook group. Then now I'm interacting with other people there. And, and as I am, number one, it's making my journey make a little more sense because mm -hmm. they're saying things that maybe I hadn't thought of it that way. And, and I'm like, Oh my gosh, yes, I need to look into that. And I'm now helping them and we're helping each other. And I love a community. I love a community. Okay. My logo is four heads with their arms around each other. Oh, that's, that's cool. I love, I love a community. And every time I was able to help somebody, it, it validated my journey a little bit more. It made my journey make a little more sense. And they were experiencing the same thing with, with me and with each other. It mm -hmm. really became a place for people to help each other. Right. And as this developed, I thought, why in the world? I, I need to go ahead and get some certification and some, you know, uh, let's let's take this a little further. And so then right. I looked at explored into life coaching, and that's the path I went. Very cool. And tell us about um, and and I love that story. And if we had another hour, um, <laughs> that part would be like as interesting as everything else. But um, sorry, we, we're running out of time. But tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about what you became where are you now um as as a life coach as um one of the leading voices on 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 this topic um an inspirational person a person who is a role model um mm -hmm. where what do you do now and 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 what's it what's it like for you so so when i was post divorce it was about mm -hmm. a year maybe post divorce. I I was getting overwhelmed with reading what people were putting in the Facebook group, and and the, it was triggering to me. Like right. it was, I couldn't handle it emotionally, and I actually walked away for about six months. I will I will say this: I walked away mm -hmm. from that group. I put it in the hands of a trusted friend, mm -hmm. and and I told the group, "Look, I I got to take a break from narcissism. If I'm not thinking about narcissism all the time, what in the world do I think about?" Like I needed some of me, you know, at that point because mm -hmm. I was still feeling pretty um, just overwhelmed by all of it. That phase really was a transition for me because that's where I really, you know, Debbie Mirza calls it cocooning. That's yeah. where I really kind of isolated myself, made my world smaller and safer and spent right. a lot of energy into my own healing. When I came back out of that, like in essence came up for air or, you know, became the butterfly out of the cocoon, I was ready. I was like, okay, we are doing this. I am out there now to help this world. Right. And um, and so that's that's the mission. I just I want to reach out. I want people to know they're not alone. I am a firm believer in the value of community, which is again where in this Facebook group, the whole goal of that group is for people to help each other. It's not for professionals coming in. It's not for um, you know any because we're very firm on no soliciting. It's for neighbors helping neighbors, people right. helping people. And and the value of that. So I'm, I'm very community based, and so now I'll I've got a little thing. really, yes. really, really quickly. So this whole cocooning thing um, for six months, the way I see it is, you needed is a very healthy process. You needed to build space in between your journey of coming out and surviving and 
protecting yourself and your kids and time to get to know yourself, to heal, to, or what I would call build self-love abundance so that you had this foundation of mental health. And when you got there, you then move forward. That is an extraordinary um, self-awareness and an extraordinary decision. So, and kudos yeah. goes yeah. to you. So well, I know thank you. you. It was right. a valuable decision. <laughs> yeah, I just didn't, I didn't want to miss that part. So please continue. Yeah. Yeah, so that was a very, very valuable decision for me. And and then as it as this has grown, um, I'm I will say I'm very humbled by just the the response, the response of the world. Uh, I mean, this reaches around the world. This is not exclusive to you know U.S. or North America or England right. or Scotland or whatever. It's not exclusive to any single location, any single career path, any gender, any race. It's not. This is so widespread and, and it, it breaks my heart every time that people are in need of this kind of help, but thank God we've got it. And, and we're able to give that and able to reach out and, and provide that. You are, you are quite modest. So, um, and, and I, I respect that you actually have made a huge impression on the global scale. Um, what, how, how much is your, podcast listen to it it's you're like one of the top top podcasters on the subject um am i correct yeah. yeah yes yes you are correct and and honestly i don't read a lot of the numbers i let my producer do that <laughs> and i just keep doing what i'm doing yeah. um but i know that we've had you know we've had over a million downloads i know that you know we are hitting record numbers every time you know uh with all the releases and and i i I want to get to the point where, you know, I could release an episode every day, but right. it's, that's, that's not a commitment I can uphold right now right. Uh, you know, in my own world. But I have a lot of visions of where I want all of this to go. Um, I'm constantly, you know, expanding our reach as gently as I can, because I, I refuse to make this, um, you know, so costly that nobody can get the help they want. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's just little gentle um, bumps in what I'm doing and the work that I'm providing. So tell our listeners and viewers um, what services your CNG group provide and how um, they can get a, get in touch with you, how they can um, reach out for help. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. And I want to say one little piece about the letters C and G. So that's Covert Narcissism mm -hmm. Group. That's how that started. Yeah. Well, then as I started to do this, I had people who can't have the word narcissism show up on their, you know, Facebook feed or their oh, credit card statement or any anything. And so CNG is that's part of why we shortcutted it to be those three letters stands for community and grace. Oh, that's and, so that yeah. Is and I do have I have two websites. I have covert narcissism dot com. Uh, that is my main website in regards to just information, getting information out there to to everybody. But then I also have a separate website that's cnglifecoaching.com. That website is where people then go to find me for setting up sessions or any of that. So that that just looks like a life coaching page and, yeah. uh, and does not have that connection to the word narcissism. It's interesting. Um, for different reasons, I, I am a big proponent of changing the name codependency to self-love deficit disorder mm -hmm. because one is highly stigmatized and has a negative um, reputation and one represents a problem that has a solution. So sure. thank you. Thank you so much for this fascinating, fascinating interview story because uh, I have no doubt um, your story and your triumph over what some people think they can never overcome. And I will say, I was one of those people who thought I could never overcome this. Um, I And if I can do it, you can do it. If, if you know, people are stronger than they know, stronger than they think they are. And, um, and there's, there's grace to be found and there's, there's healing to be found. There is life after narcissism. <laughs> yes, there is. Well, yeah. let's not make this the, the second and the last. I look forward to the next yeah. time we talk because when I talk to you, I learn a lot. I appreciate you even more. And I just have fun. So thank you for that. And <laughs> thank you, Ross. Thank you for having me on your show. And thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to get to know you and to spend this time together. Thank you. You take care now. Bye-bye.